Hi, this is uh, Latin Times El Cafe, and today we have a, a really good guest. We have Enrique Castillo from Blood In and Blood Out. Yeah, uh, if you remember 80s, him from huh? back then, yeah, and uh, Weeds, the HBO series oh, Weeds, yeah, yeah. Mi Familia, etc. He's uh, he's working on a project right now. We're going to talk about called Ruben Salazar Project and a mariachi document. So we're going to get on right now with with uh, with uh, Enrique Castillo. Um, but before we get on, um, let's go through some of the the things he's done. Yeah. Um, so he uh, he's been in and blood it blood in blood out weeds mi familia. And he's currently working on the, the Ruben Salazar project and a mariachi documentary. Yes. Which uh, the Ruben Salazar, uh, August 29th of this year, will mark the 50th anniversary of the Chicano moratorium and the date that Ruben Salazar was shot and killed. So yeah. we're going to let him expound on that. And uh, <clears throat> so, so you guys can be aware of that. And also get to get to know uh, uh, Enrique Castillo. He's a wonderful guy. And we'll be right back with that. We'll be right back.
Can you hear me now? I can't hear you. Can, can you hear us hear now? You. Can you hear us now? Yeah. We just can't hear you. Oh. Everything you said uh, allowed the mic. Yeah, check your mic. Check your mic on your on your phone. Uh, I'm on my computer. How about now? Okay, is your mic on? Unmuted? Yes. So, yeah. You can't hear me now? It's oh, you know what it is? Hold on. I'm sorry. Hold on. Okay. okay. How about now? You can hear us okay, right? I can hear you. But you can't. It says my mic is muted. Let me see. Try again. Try again. Can't hear you. I keep clicking at it. It won't unmute. Okay. What I'm going to do is. It's unmuted. Okay. Can you, hear, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yay, we can hear you. Yeah, we found, figured out we what it is. We can hear you now. Yeah, put your volume on. Okay. Okay. As always, isn't technology tremendously fun? Yeah, I, I didn't have Chrome, so. <laughs> oh, oh, I know. this. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. How are you, Enrique? I'm good. The weather's good out here. Nice and warm. Yeah. Wow. Are you where are you at? We're very really warm right here. I'm in uh, an unincorporated part of Los Angeles called Valinda. Oh, hmm. okay. It's a very small community. We don't have sidewalks. It's zoned for animals, so people have horses. Oh, nice. Lots of roosters. You got so you got some chickens and roosters and horses and all that. We don't, but people around us do. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, we're in the country too. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, we I like it. I like it better than the city just about now, especially. <laughs> yeah. We're a little bit like we're north of Tampa in Florida. Okay. Yeah. I was I was in Florida probably about a month before this whole thing happened with the virus. Yeah. yeah. We were in Miami. Wow. We went to shoot some some uh, Los uh, Mariachi Cobre, over yeah, at, yeah, at Disney World. Nice. Oh, okay. Nice. So, so you're familiar with Florida over here, and uh, nice I've been in and out, mostly you know, just passing through. Oh, that's cool. So, uh, um, how are you holding up over there with all this going on? Well, we're good. We've been well. This is about a day around day 110 of staying in wow oh wow and we usually just uh, go out for our usual morning walk although it's outside and there's nobody around we still take our mask yeah uh, anytime somebody comes around everybody's pretty pretty cool about it you know we like give each other a space yeah our six feet yeah, more, even more so. <laughs> <laughs> Make it seven or eight. <laughs> Twelve is good. That's true. So uh, either that or and the other thing is the, you know the the market. Yeah. So yeah. my wife my wife goes a lot more than I do. So. To the market. Yeah. yeah. So so how many series have you watched so far? <laughs> um. <laughs> Series, not a lot, but a lot of films and documentaries. Wow. And then I had a whole library of 
films. Um, I love classic films, so I rewatch some of those. Yeah. Done a lot of reading, a lot of writing. Oh, that's good. So projects that are we're trying to line up. Yeah. Um, I just finished a treatment for one project. I just sent it off. Uh, oh. I finished a Western script. Nice. And uh, just before this thing hit, I was supposed to travel to shoot something in San Antonio. But here wow. we are. <laughs> yeah. I lived there for three years in San Antonio. Nice town. I like it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really looking forward to heading back, but going to have to wait. Yeah, yeah, I know. We're all in the same boat. So tell us about your, your family, where your family's from, where you were born and everything. I was born and raised in Imperial Valley, which is the southernmost valley in California, between, between San Diego and the Arizona border. And it's a. I was born and raised in a town called Calexico, mm. which means it's a combination of California and Mexico, Calexico. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Yeah, and the city across the border, because it's a border town, is Mexicali. Ah, <laughs> see, see, see. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I have family across the border, uh, but we were raised in Calexico, mm -hmm. and we were a family of farm workers. Uh, so I worked in the fields with my father from, geez, as far back as I can remember to my sophomore year in, in college. Wow. Yeah, so weekends and holidays and summer vacations pretty much were spent working in the fields. Wow. wow. So yes, I was. Uh, I'm very familiar with <laughs> where the food comes from. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. And hard work too. And yes, extremely. Yes. In that time, it was. Um, there were no bathrooms out in the fields. Hmm. Uh, wow. There weren't any breaks. Um, sometimes we worked peacetime. So depending on how much we produced, other times there are very few times where I worked by the hour right mm -hmm. and my father my father came from mexico from uh calisco and he came when he was very young um he crossed legally he paid 10 cents to get across wow eventually became a citizen but he he actually he apprenticed with a a very renowned commercial painter in guadalajara he learned how to mix colors from scratch and all that. And they painted a lot of the government buildings. So that was his profession. And when he came to the US, he came complete with his air compressor, with his airless gun, his painting suit with a regulator. And wow. he couldn't find any work. Yeah. Um, and then a friend of his, after a while, told him, you're not going to be able to get that kind of work here because that's for that's for gringos. Yeah. So that was his introduction to prejudice, yeah. not directly but indirectly. So he had his friend told him, "If you want to make some money, uh, I I have a job working out in the field." So he joined him, and eventually he, because of his ability to distinguish colors, he was able to gauge when the produce was going to be ready to harvest. So he be became one of the sought after employees with the growers. Mm. So he taught us, my brother and I, how to gauge the produce when it was green, when it was about to get ready, when it was ripe or overripe. And, um, and so during the summers, they would send us or him, and we had to go as a family uh -huh. north ahead of everybody else so that he could gauge uh, when the crops were going to be ready to harvest. In particular, we spent a lot of time harvesting cantaloupes. Wow. Working in the packing sheds. 
Um, and because we could tell the, the different uh, grades of color in the, in the produce, we were the sought after family to hire. Mm-hmm. Wow. But it also, it also, he, he was, he's, he was kind of a chauvinist in a way, you know, he didn't like women in his crews. Uh-huh. Uh, he felt that, uh, for one reason was that the, the guys were going to flirt with the girls. Mm, get distracted. <laughs> also that, uh, that the girls, for example, when we were working in the cantaloupes, uh, there was only one time when he was stuck with a crew that included women in one of the packing sheds because it was not a usual shed that we went to work in. Wow. So there was a crew already there that he had to take on. And there were several women in the crew. And I had never seen him so frustrated. Because <laughs> <laughs> wow. um, he, he, he would get upset because some of the women would grab a cantaloupe with two hands, whereas we were expected to grab two eight. cantaloupes. And when when the produce was on a conveyor belt at full speed, mm-hmm. it's it very, very difficult. And uh, my brother was in charge of the conveyor belts. Yeah. And over and over and over at the top of, my, of his lungs, he would scream, I'm I never heard my brother's name scream so many times. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that. We did. We cut grapes. We did. We did uh, gathered figs, uh, nuts, tomato, carrots. You name it. So we did it. Uh, that was that was my introduction to hard work and perseverance, and also. Um, uh, something he, he always mentioned to us was uh, if you're working at that time, you, we were still using short handled hoes. And also when we worked in the asparagus, uh, we had to bend over and carry strapped onto our hip uh, a cut off five gallon can, metal can, wow. mm. where you had to cut the asparagus and then you had to grab a handful and then put them in that can. And you couldn't unload that can until it was absolutely full. Wow. We spent a lot of time with a long time with an indent- indention of the belt across our waist. Wow. I bet. And five and gallons, a lot. One thing he always said was um, when you bend down, don't get up because it's going to be twice as hard to bend back down. So that was, that was a, a very profound uh, enlightenment that I learned from him. <laughs> Well, yeah. I guess it would be equivalent to uh, put your nose to the grindstone. <laughs> yeah, That's right. I think so. Don't give up. Sure. <laughs> yeah, and it and and I guess you know it prepared you for life and anything it's going to throw at you because you know you're you you've gone through that kind of stuff. That's it's tough. It's toughened you. It's uh, yeah. It's it definitely is. Uh, it's hard work now, uh-huh. uh, even before when you consider that even up into the 19, late 1960s, probably the average lifespan of a farm worker was 45 years old. Yeah. Because the work is so grueling and uh, you're out there exposed to all the elements. Yeah. And, uh, it does. It, it really toughens you up internally and externally. Uh, so yes, now you know air conditioning, and a lot of them own their own cars. They travel to the fields in cars. We used to travel in in a truck that my father had that had no air conditioning and uh, would get full of dust when you were out in the fields. Um, like I said, no restrooms. You had to pile up a bunch of rocks. Or, mm-hmm. or go into a deep irrigation canal and get mm-hmm. as much privacy as you could there. There you go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which is another reason why there weren't any women in his crews. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound too nice. I mean, it that's was, not, it, I would not, do. not a lot of privacy. No, no. 
but yeah, be understanding. But yes, com comparatively speaking, what I do now, sit at my desk and write or go on a set and, you know, get paid for sitting around and it's, it's a, it's a no brainer. Yeah. I have complete respect. I do anything I can to help with the farm workers, as you can see uh -huh. by what's on the wall here. Yes. Uh, it was a gift from uh, Artie uh, at the UFW. So wow. whatever yeah. I can do to help uh, farm workers, I'm there. Yes. That's awesome. So tell us about the current project you're working on, uh, Ruben Sal the Ruben Salazar uh, project. Oh, you heard about that one, huh? Yes. Yeah, we did. Uh, and the mariachi can't, document. Can't say, can't say too much because I'm in an MDA on that. Oh, I got yeah. you. But it's yeah. uh, you know it's it's an LA story, so it's very apropos to to uh, the situation and considering what from you know from uh, what is now um, in the public domain, a lot of his information and and how he how he was uh, how he met his end. Um, but I was fortunate enough that. I was involved with a theater company downtown, the the uh, Latino Theater Company. Mm -hmm. I helped establish that, and we wrote a production, a full length play called August Twenty Nine. And one of, and the central character was a female, uh, going for her PhD, and she was writing a book about Ruben Salazar, and I played uh, Ruben in the production, that was the male lead. And while we were doing our research, we were fortunate that uh, his wife, Sally, was still alive. Mm. And uh, we got in touch with her through her daughter, Lisa, and they graciously granted us an interview and we spent a couple of hours or more just really getting familiar with his personal life. Um, and what was obviously interesting was that his life, when he went to work and when he hung around with his buddies in L.A., it was a completely different experience than he lived in Orange County at his home and his many Anglo friends that he had there hosting pool parties. And his kids were not taught Spanish. Yeah. His mother had a lot of influence on him. She was um, very anglicized and wanted him to steer his life in that direction. His father was very, his father was dark skinned, very Mexicano, so he loved mariachis. Yeah. Ah. So, so Ruben uh, lived a life of uh, uh, that were completely at odds with each other, yeah. but in a sense, really helped him center himself as far as being objective to both sides. Uh, which opened him up also for criticism from both sides. Yeah. He was either a, either a left-leaning communist by the way he wrote, or he was a, or he was a Tio Taco. <laughs> and um, he had to survive and try to present a balanced uh, perspective to both experiences, but primarily... Mm -hmm to the Latino community because he was the only Latino journalist at any paper that he ever went to and could speak Spanish. And so naturally he was always given those assignments uh, while he excelled at it and the quality of his work was world-class. Uh, he still wanted to be able to write about world issues that didn't include Latinos. He wanted to go to Vietnam, but an Anglo was sent there ahead of him. Mm. And then he was sent to be the news director in uh, in Mexico City uh, when uh, El Golpe happened there, you know, the uh, mm. Amanecer uh, at Tlatelolco. Uh, he was in the Dominican Republic because he could understand and write Spanish. So um, wherever it needed a Spanish language a journalist. They sent him because he was the only one they had. Wow. And of course, when he spoke with the 
Latino community, he learned more and more uh, the difficulties that the community was going through because a lot of the papers never used to publicize in-depth articles about the struggle of the Latino community. Right. And because at first he didn't find that as maybe glamorous as reporting about Vietnam or other world issues, little by little, after he came from Mexico City, he was assigned to the Latino community. Mm. And the more and more he got involved, he began to write more about the issues from a much more in-depth perspective and much more sympathetic to the tune where he eventually got in conflict with the establishment, both the sheriff's department, law, law enforcement in general. They already had a file of his at the FBI. He was already being monitored. Mm. He was already being monitored by the DEA. Yeah. Um, particularly because of his perspective during the Vietnam War when he went there to write. And then with his writings in, in Mexico City, Mexican government there wasn't pleased mm. with how he was portraying the, the actual incident at Tlatelolco and other issues. Um, so he became, he became a target Yes. to uh, the establishment and law enforcement in particular, where he had direct confrontations uh, with the chief of police at Davis, uh, threatened him. Uh, they mm -hmm. sent, uh, he, he, he aired when he became the news director at KMEX. He, uh, and this is all again, public knowledge in the public domain. He, uh, he aired a report with survivors of a, of a shooting that happened in Santa Ana. Mm. Uh, two cousins were killed by the police um, because they, they responded to an incident of a domestic dispute. They went to the wrong apartment and they busted in with shotguns and there were undocumented in there. Two of them were cousins. They, they were the Sanchez cousins mm. and they murdered both of them. Oh my, oh my God. They didn't even, they didn't understand English and the cops didn't speak Spanish. And so they killed them and Ruben, they interviewed the survivors. And when it aired, uh, it became a huge issue with the Latino community, a lot of protests and they accused them of murder. And shortly thereafter, two plain clothes detectives went to see Ruben at the television station, KMEX, Mm -hmm. basically told him that the Latino community was not sophisticated enough to understand and that it could be very dangerous. Uh, so tongue in cheek threat and uh, they left and Ruben being a, a journalist devoted to his craft and seeing a newsworthy article here, he wrote in his column at the LA Times, which he continued even when he went to be news director at KMEX, he actually wrote about that incident, in effect, calling out the police, saying these guys came and threatened me for doing my job. Mm. And uh, not long after that, uh, it's when the moratorium happened and uh, he was killed by wow. law enforcement. And yeah. it was determined that it was a homicide, but the hearing officer, Pitlock was his name. Mm -hmm. You've seen uh, Requiem 29, the documentary of the inquest. Uh, it was slanted more towards uh, trying to indict the, the community instead of looking into the cause of death and determining that it merited um, a trial to mm -hmm. find out, you know, who was guilty of the homicide because the inquest did determine that it was a homicide. So the hearing officer determined that there wasn't enough evidence and he refused to, uh, to have a trial to file charges. 
So wow. a lot of the information that Sally, his wife, Ruben's wife, uh, was able to communicate with us um, is in my files. And so I'll be able to draw on that. Um, and I've been in contact over the years with his, dog, his daughter, Lisa. Uh, he had three children. Lisa was the oldest, Stephanie, and John was the youngest. Um, but I, I, I specifically had one question for Sally that kind of caused her to really, I, I maybe she hadn't thought about it, but she gave me her perspective, what her take was on how he met his end. Um, but there was one other issue that kept coming up, which was, well, Ruben hung out with a bunch of white people and he was accused of being a Tio Taco and all mm. of that. And then he was with the Mexicanos and he loved mariachis and drank tequila and all whatnot. Mm -hmm. and we interviewed his drinking buddies. Mm. And there's a lot of stuff that we learned about Ruben's personal conduct when he wasn't with his wife and the Anglooks. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously she wasn't aware of that stuff and so I asked her I said would you grant me that that your husband had a life completely different from the life that he lived with you and your children in Orange County Yeah. and she took a long time she, she took a lot of deep breaths and then she took a sigh and then she said, yes, I'll give you that. And that kind of opened the door for us to explore and be able to present Ruben in a very human perspective, uh, rather than portray him as most people portray him as, well, he died for the cause and He's been right. and what, which to me is perfectly okay. I think yeah. he, he deserves that recognition. But to tell the real story of this human being, because that's what he was. He was a guy that was had feelings. He had dreams, yeah. and aspirations. Yeah. He had prejudices. He had a lot of things that. You know, he was resentful of his employers. Uh, he could have easily been, you know, pushed. If he was pushed a little further, farther, who knows? Could he have ended up being a disgruntled employee because he was yeah. because he was uh, discriminated against? You know, yeah, true. Sure. So right. that that's that's my approach to how I want to tell the story. Sure. And hopefully it'll go well, which is what I try to do in most of the stuff that I write. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the material that I've written, yeah, I've not shared with a lot of people because I've never wanted to entrust it to uh, the Hollywood machine. Yeah. Sure. Um, and so I've been hoping and praying that, um, less praying than hoping, really. <laughs> I don't put much stock in that except for, you know, you kind of put your nose to the grindstone like I <laughs> uh, it is is for for our community to to be eventually in a position where many, many of these stories can be green lit and we do them the way we see them, the way we know them. Uh, that we don't sugarcoat them and downgrade them to a lot of the stuff we've seen, I, I saw the story of Guy Gabaldon recently mm -hmm. in the 50s, I think, a Latino war hero played by Jeffrey Hunter. Yeah. Uh, a five foot six guy played by a six foot two guy with, with blue eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so many, you know, Pancho Villa and yeah. you know, all this stuff that, that has never either been done right or has always been dismissed. We have so much material to draw from. Sure. And in order to do it right, we we can't 
entrusted to the powers that be at this time. Many times we've had pitch meetings or whatnot. I'll tell you one interesting story. Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro, right? He's an Oscar winning director, tells the story about a pitch that he went to do. And he's Mexicano, speaks good English, but with an accent. So he says that he's pitching the story and they just love the story. And then they ask him, well, who's going to direct it? And he's like, totally like blown away. He says, well, me. <laughs> and no. they said to him, but you have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, That's this true. About that. Even Woody Gilbert tells a story about wanting to do the story of Rosa Parks. And they wanted a little woman to play her. And Whoopi kept saying, she's black. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that, you know, the, the concept of the concept of the closer you get to the truth, they don't grasp the concept. It's always, well, the best actor got hired for the job. Right. Really. Right. Really. Right, right. You know, Lee J. Right. Uh, Lee J. Cobb. Or Yul Brynner as Pancho Villa. Yeah, that was, a, I was going to say. That. Actor for the job. Yeah. You know, Johnny Depp at least had the, had the, the insight that when he was pitched to do Pancho Villa. Yeah. He yeah. responded, well, you don't want some honky from Kentucky play? Yeah, there you go. That's not going to work. <laughs> Make it as realistic as possible, please. Right. Well, yeah. you know, at least get, Closer, you know. Yeah, a lot closer. And there's so so many talented actors that could have been chosen that match the blood. Yeah, and also, and also um, just the idea of building bankable personalities. Sure. It is, you see very often throughout film where. An untested actor, an inexperienced actor is put in a role, and then based on that role, then they give him another role and an, or her another role and another role, and pretty soon you have a successful bankable personality. Right. But when it comes to people of color, you are in a low-budget film, and even though you're playing a major role in it, the promotion for it is not there. Right. And consequently, your project is still being measured against a multi-million dollar budget film from Hollywood. And there's no forgiveness. There's no, oh, well, we're going to consider you because you didn't have that much money. No, it's either you cut the mustard or you don't. And how many low budget films have really surfaced to where they've won a, you know, a best picture Oscar. Sure. Or, or at least made, made, uh, made a killing at the box office. Yeah. yeah it's, yeah. it's a, it's a long way to catch up with, with those well, kind yeah, of budgets. So many times you, you're set up for failure. Um, industry knows, for example, one of my favorite, uh, questions to 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 people when when we attend conferences or whatnot and, and we talk about why latino movies or other films don't 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 uh, become successful why don't latino actors why aren't they able to become successful bigger stars and, and you know you ask the question is well why do people go to the movies mm -hmm. and of course you get the typical answers well you know escapism um, yeah. people want to see heroes uh, people, it's entertainment. It's da 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 da. And my thing is, you know, the only reason that people want to go to the movies is because the studios tell them to go, right? That's which right. is called advertising. So if you have a low budget movie, and you don't have at least as much money that you put out or more for for promotions, nobody's going to know it's there, right? That's true. And so the studios promote, promote, promote to tell you, you have to go see this movie. Otherwise, if they didn't promote it, you wouldn't know it's at the theater. Right. And the same thing, it, the same thing happens with television. Exactly. With, uh, with series that have um, Latino actors and actresses in it. 
there's there's not the same amount of promotion, be more promotion for those shows and yeah. support yeah. system right. for those shows. You're and right. so and so, so then we end up not knowing about them. And so, yeah, you know. And we consequently also is we as a culture uh, that have contributed so much to the building and the maintenance and maintaining of the industry. We don't have a support system for each other. Yes. Like the studios. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a microcosm of, of our entire society that hires every conceivable uh, aspect of the rest of society, whether it's lawyers, whether it's accountants, whether it's architects, whether it's labor, construction, medical, you name it, you know, electricians, firemen, yeah. <laughs> everybody. Yeah maintains those studios and it's a lot of people of color that do it now granted right. they started building it they created it very much like the real estate industry uh -huh. with their financing they hired the people they hired an architect which is your screenwriter they hired the rest of the people okay build me my house mm -hmm. now they've got their house that we all helped to build and they're the only ones that are going to live in it because that's who started it. So now, where shall we learn from it and say, right. let, do we say, let us live in your house and live according to your rules? Or do we build our own house and live according to our rules? There you go. And decorate there you go. how we want. And so naturally, it's financing that is going to have to go hand in hand. And the way to gain financing, of course, is that many of the investors that are Latino that you go to, we've all been nurtured with the, by the film industry to have certain expectations from the audience and their expectations of what they're going to see. Yes. Oh, it has to have this in it. It has to have that in it. And mm -hmm. so some independent producers kind of parrot what the industry tells everybody else. Well, we have to have better screenplays. We have to write it this way. Uh, we have to hire these people. So we end up parroting the same things and saying things like, well, the camera has to like you. Really? <laughs> you, can't have, you can't have an accent. And how do you explain Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jean-Claude Van Damme and Russell Crowe? Mm -hmm. <laughs> these people with accents play whatever, and yet when right. it comes to us, I don't have a particularly thick Mexican accent, so why couldn't I be Gladiator? There you go. Right. There you go. <laughs> That's so That's because we look better. The rules don't apply to them, but they <laughs> definitely apply to us. So, again... We have to support our own. Yes, we do. And be yeah. that judgmental because a low budget movie doesn't look like ET. Right. You know? Right. Right. They're it's always the by the Oscar. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. True. It's the stories too, you know, that we're telling. Yes. Those, those are important to be told. Absolutely. Um, and so many. And so many that they so many stories. That they still redo. Yes. You know? Yeah, that's true. Sure. Yeah, I would love to see a Pancho Villa movie with the real, you know, or someone, some who knows, someone who's actually Latino. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and part black at that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. About sure. that. There you go. There you go. For sure. So yes, that uh, that's pretty much where yeah. where I function, the work that I want to do. Yeah. I've told stories about. Latino Medal of Honor recipients that go back yeah. to the Civil War that wow. most people don't even know. Our history goes back to the American Revolution. Yeah. I have script about that, a true yeah. story um, that I've not shared with many people. I have a story about Civil War heroes, Medal wow. of Honor recipient that's based on a true story. Um, and I find more and more that that I want to tell, and I've been waiting, as I said, for 
for us to be in a position to be able to tell them right. Sure. Yes. That makes sense. Let, let's talk about some of the films you've been in, like Blood In, Blood Out, in the series Weeds, Mi Familia, and any other any other movies that you have been in. All um, outstanding, pro, all outstanding projects. Um, yeah. I I've often been asked which one is my favorite, and honestly, I always have to say that uh, it's El Norte. El Norte. Ah yes. Which is my it's it's my favorite. Um, I mean that 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 film uh, was so groundbreaking, so profound, and so apropos even to today. Uh, mm. I don't know if you've had a chance to see the restored version. Uh, we we got to see the restored version at the Academy. Wow! And it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, okay. And the storyline, the, the you know that that. That script is told in three languages, indigenous, Spanish, and, and uh, English. Wow. And, and actors that were multilingual. It was a multi-ethnic cast. Uh, there were no stars in it. Um, and the, the writing team of Gregory Nava and uh, Anna Thomas mm. uh, were, were uh, insightful enough to bring on board people who knew better than them yes in terms of the indigenous culture uh, the music and, and and everywhere along the way they they were extremely collaborative uh gregory as a director he my experience with him has always been uh one of complete trust uh from both sides um, he's trusted me with El Norte, he trusted me in Mi Familia, mm -hmm. and he trusted me in uh, American Family, the PBS series. And we've always worked very well together. Um, his trust in me goes to allowing me to be able to uh, adjust uh, scenes in terms of dialogue. In El Norte, David Villalpando, who played the, the male lead, uh, we shot the scene, uh, a croissant scene. It's a, got you know kind of a pathos in there. It's, and we shot at the Prince's Restaurant in Century City. And it had an upper level. And mm -hmm. while we were shooting, uh, Gregory said, uh, uh, here, you guys, uh, you guys know more about this than I do. Go upstairs and fix this thing. And so David and I went upstairs and then we just had a great time uh, working the scene and we came back down and we ran it for Gregory and we were all just totally thrilled. All of us, did. everybody was like in stitches with some of the dialogue and understood the other thing about undocumented. Um, it, it, it turned out to be, you know, one of my favorite scenes. Um, but the entire project is, is just, you know, I, I, I always go back to that one as being my favorite. Awesome. That's so what, what is, uh, here's a very important question. What is, what is your favorite Latino food? Latino food? Yes, sir. Is there a multiple choice with yeah, all? Yeah, you, you can throw. Well, yeah, <laughs> we would expect multiple. Yeah, ones. yeah, definitely. My favorite Latino food, pizza. <laughs> ah, so we did create pizza. No, no. Uh, if you had to pin me down, I've always, I've always said, you know, to people too, is like. If I were marooned on a on an island somewhere, what food would I want to have with me? I'd say frijoles. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting because you know Chile. We we love Chile, man. You know, yeah. and uh, we we put Chile on everything. And my wife makes it, and and 
uh, my experience with when she roasts the chile, I wrote it, some dialogue into the western that I wrote, and one of the characters is is describing uh, the food that he wants to give this little boy. Wow. Who does, he's mute and he doesn't he doesn't understand Spanish, so he tells wow. him in English, and he tells him he tells him Jesusita, she's the real miracle worker because she's the one that makes the most important part of the meal, the chile. I just, <laughs> let me tell you, watch out because when she starts roasting that chile, <laughs> look out! You've never coughed and shed so many tears in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and then okay. it's, so, it's so hot that yeah. you, when you eat it, you can make you can feel your beard grow. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's the best! That's yeah, the best. So, so my wife makes chile that I compared to, I guess it would be the equivalent of consuming battery acid. <laughs> wow. Wow. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds dangerous. It's hot. <laughs> but it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so tell us about any fun, funny moments that occurred while in, 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 a, in a film that you can remember one of your funniest moments while filming that happened. Funny moments, man. They're, they're, yeah, it's, I can't find experiences though. Um, there was, you know, I, I've always felt when I've worked on a play, for example, and when you start rehearsing, it's you 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 sit down for the table read, and that first day is like the first day of school, and you get your pencil, you know, you you get your eraser, you get your highlighter. You get everything ready, then you go through, and everybody then kind of mingles, and you talk, and you meet each other, and you start building relationships and whatnot, and then you get into the work, you know? And when you start getting into the work, you make a lot of mistakes. And when you make mistakes, it's real people involved in these very unique situations that is only apropos to people in the arts. And then that stage actors in particular, that I'm sure comedy troops go through the same thing, but in a, when you start working on the play, you flub your lines, you go to the wrong mark, and you know, you, you do all this, these weird things that sometimes yeah. are very humorous. You fall off the stage. Oh my. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, it's really funny. And then even though certain things happen when you're already into performance, you've got your characters down and whatnot. And sometimes you'll go up on your lines and, and what's the old man, you have to tap dance to get back online. But by that point, it's like you're doing almost the same thing every performance over and over, day in and day out, for at least four weeks, let's say, of the typical wow. production. So you begin to cure your character of the neuroses that you created for him when you were building him. Yeah. <laughs> and so all of that exciting, beautiful, human interaction, insecurity, moments of elation, all of that life experience, the audience never sees. Right. And true. that to me is the beautiful part of the work. Wow. And the audience never gets to see that. Yeah, those behind and, the scenes stuff. If you could, if we could film that and kind of condense it into like a highlights thing. Right, moments. Yeah. Moments, moments. I think it could be very entertaining. Yeah. Oh, yeah. People, people, sure. are, people are very interested in behind the scenes of the making of a film. Uh-huh. But you rarely see it with stage productions. Yeah. True. That's true. So, yeah, one of, again, you know, one of, one of my favorite moments in, in acting with another actor is when the other actor, either you or the other actor goes up on their lines 
and the look on the face <laughs> priceless. <laughs> <laughs> it's priceless that's funny <laughs> I had a moment I was doing a play and I had a monologue and all the actors were behind me in different spots on the stage and it was just me in front of the audience doing this monologue and I went up on my lines oh wow and it looked to me, it seemed like it went on for 20 minutes or so. Wow. Oh, Lord. And I just sat there retracing, how the hell did I start this thing? And, and then afterwards, I talked to the other actors. And of course, when you do it so many times, some of them already know your dialogue. Yeah. Because in particular, they have to know their cue. Right. And so... The other actors were saying, oh, man, you know, we wanted to say it so much. We to give you the clue. <laughs> so, yeah, that, 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 you know, when, when you look back, it's like, man, that was, that was funny. Wow. And we so, went, uh, uh, I, did, I did a production where we took it on tour. And you know how how conscientious we are about safety, and uh, you know you cover all your, you duct tape all the cables, and you you patch up anything, you wipe the floor, you make you put glow tape, you put everything safe for you and the audience. Right. So we go to this theater somewhere in the Midwest, and and the stage had. All of these holes in the in the wood in the stage, oh my gosh. and none of the none of the cables were were taped down, and so you know we had to bring it to their attention and whatnot, and and so they started taking care of it, and then all of a sudden we're getting ready to start rehearsing, and we hear this whirr sound, this high whirring sound. And these two guys come in with leaf blowers. Uh, <laughs> and they're, the blowing, they're blowing all the seats. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. The leaf blowers, you know how loud they are. <laughs> they blow everything all over the place. That's hilarious. Wow. <laughs> so then we get uh, we get to where, and it was a big theater. It was like 2,000 seats. Oh wow. my gosh. So we finally start the rehearsal process. And, and okay, you know, to throw on the lights and they throw on the lights and about three or four seats in the audience, because, you know, the, the, the frame on the bottom is metal. All of a sudden they started arcing sparks. They throwing sparks up in electrical. <laughs> they were oh shorting out. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, wow. What an adventure. Wow. <laughs> People start freaking out. <laughs> we were like, "Oh my gosh!" You know, so wow. we, we brought, we had him bring in a fire marshal, electrician. Oh, it's like you know, we, we we cannot, we can't, we just can't do this. <laughs> so who, so who in your life has always been your hero and inspiration? I I have a. I have kind of a, um, I would not say a phobia, but I really try to discourage people from putting so much emphasis in others uh, mm -hmm. to the point where you end up mimicking or you end up kind of, um, you in, in Spanish, you would say, te entregas demasiado. Uh, oh, sí, sí. You, you kind of give up something of yourself that you may have made a choice on your own, but because you want to emulate someone, you end up kind of like killing that thing within you. Yeah. And the more you do that, and the more people you do that with, then you end up being almost somebody else rather than organically yourself. Right. But that's not to say that I don't admire other people. Um, 
and to different degrees um, where you would say the greatest actor of all time, Sir Laurence Olivier, you know, but I never saw Laurence Olivier play a Latino. Yeah, that's true. And do it convincingly enough for me to say, wow, man, do I have a lot of work to do to play a Latino? <laughs> or for that matter, or for that that's matter, a good point. That's a good I point. Saw, I saw Marlon Brando as Zapata, and oh. while he is masterful within in front of a camera and internalize a lot of the dialogue, inner dialogue of a human being being Zapata. He didn't convince me that he was a Latino. <laughs> so, you know, sure. I, I, I admire the work and I envy the work. But to say I want to be like that person is to me um, surrendering so much of oneself that, yes. that you end up kind of, you know, in the end, trying to search for yourself, and then in the end, where you really find it, and you 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 begin to really try to convey who you are in essence, you end up either you can't speak Spanish well because you tried to give it up to try to fit in, yeah, yeah. or you can't emote the way you would have been able to if you have heard mariachis and you were really you know. You know, when you start hearing mariachi, I still get goosebumps just talking about it. Me too. Yeah. I love mariachis. But in a sense, that's what the industry has kind of done to us, is that we've been expected to abandon our culture and mm -hmm. what we are in order to go along to get along. Yes. That, not, that then when Latinos mm -hmm. in the industry have tried to do Latino projects because all of a sudden they're newborn Latinos. The soul, el alma le falta. Yeah, mm -hmm. true. Projects. Yeah. Because it's done from a assimilated perspective rather than a real true understanding with a passion of it. Yes. Le falta el corazón. Yeah. It's just like comida Latina. If you Latino, you know, you gotta put that sazon or whatever, the chile, you well, know, and, and go to Taco Bell. It's not, it's not the same. It's not the same. It's yeah. not the same. You could get the Ta invitation or Taco the Bell might taste good, but it ain't the real thing. It, absolutely. So I'd rather go to a food truck, you know, uh where 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 um where a mom is cooking in the food truck, she's making some good ta tacos with some good guacamole, all of that, you know. Yeah, exactly. Good <laughs> you, are, you are you, you know, Luis Valdez, Luis Valdez, whom I, I collaborated with it a lot too, has always told that story about, you know, the sandwich and the taco, which we all know. <laughs> but getting back to your point about um, who do I, who do I look to, admire. who do I admire? <laughs> um, I kind of also take the position of George C. Scott or Marlon Brando, who, who George C. Scott in particular, who refused to accept his Oscar because he understood how can you pick one person over another? It, it's 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 like how do you pick one culture over another? That's I think the the wrong direction that we've been led into, into trying to somehow put ourselves at a higher rung than someone else. And then someone else is to, is to, as, as the, as the character said in, in uh, salt of the earth, yeah. uh, whose, ne whose neck do I step on in order to feel superior? And, and sometimes when you start emulating or start admiring or start creating icons for yourself and then you build yourself up to that level, 
Yeah. It can really mess with your mind and you end up being uh, the, the president of the United States. You know, thinking that you are the end all. Uh, so you end up with little things like, well, why did they call me to the set right now? I don't, I'm not doing anything. Well, why, why is why is my wardrobe not here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's my cafe con leche? Why is my why does my trailer doesn't have, why doesn't it have an air conditioner? Why did you call, why didn't you call me on the set? And then you get there. Why did you call me too early? Wow. So you get into those positions of thinking you're the end all of everything, whereas yeah. We are all extremely yeah. important on a, on a set, right. extremely. Right. And if you don't treat everybody with respect, then you don't deserve any. That's right. First of all, which is what I, what I do in part to young people that are ask me, you know, what advice do you give me about getting into the industry? Yes. Is the one thing you have to remember is it's your choice. And yeah. you have a choice after that. That's you're right. either, you're either going to enjoy it or you're going to be miserable. That's right. Yeah. You can't be happy without being a star with money, then you're not going to be happy with it. Yeah. It's like it's like it's like it says, you know, you faithful in the little, you'll be faithful in the much. But when you forget where you came from and you forget that people are all equal in the eyes of God. That's yeah, I've been, I've been on set and I have been early in my career also, you know, you, you fall into that kind of stuff, but you try to catch it as much as you can. Hopefully yeah. people that keep you humble, yeah. but, you know, you go on set sometimes and you see the behavior of your peers and it makes me ashamed. Yeah. And, and apologetic sometimes to to my collaborators you know the wardrobe people the makeup yeah. people uh the wranglers if you're doing a western the the extras anybody you anybody who is helping to make you become more successful that's right deserves this mutual respect yes but yeah. i've seen clothes wardrobe thrown all over the place wow I've seen food dumped all over the place. People use profanity against other people. You hear about actors saying, oh, you, the actors are, are told, well, don't look at that star and in, in, don't look at him in the, in the eyes. And they've literally gotten, gotten fired because they inadvertently turned a corner and were staring straight at this person and they got fired. Wow. So where does all that come from? You know? uh, if that was me getting fired, I'd say, I didn't like you anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, and you, you work, you work. I, I shot an independent film in Texas in the middle of a heat wave in the summer. Oh, yeah. And they got me an air-conditioned motorhome. Uh, and at one point it didn't work uh, and it was unbearable in there. So I just moseyed out of there and went inside where we, where everybody else was shooting, yeah. you know, and then I didn't make a big deal of it, but one of the crew, I think makeup or whatever went in there to do something and they noticed it wasn't working. So they're the ones that took care of it. It wasn't because I, you know, made a big deal out of it. I appreciated it, of course. Yeah. But we started shooting. We were shooting one scene where it was in a truck that was not air conditioned either. So it was hot, but I was inside the truck. It was shade. Yeah. But I obviously understood that while I've been in and out of air conditioning, sitting in the shade, taking breaks or whatnot, the crew has been outside all damn day wow and it's hot in texas in those conditions wow and yet people will mistreat them yeah about that yeah i've seen it i've seen it yeah I've seen it. yeah so 
what's going on right now with the Black Lives Matter and others, you know, the, the Me Too. Yeah. Uh, and now the entire structure being reevaluated, reevaluated, um, hopefully will make an impact on all of us. Yes. So that we don't fall into that hierarchical, you know, kind of structure where only people that have enough, like Warren Buffett, can say, yeah. well, how is it that I pay less taxes than my secretary, you know? Right. Only someone right. that has so much money can say that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. So we're pretty much done with the interview. And thank you so much, Enrique. It's it's been enlightening and, yes. and it's been an honor to meet you. And we wanted to ask if it was okay if we could pray for you because we're also one of our hats is we're ministers as well. Yes. And we like to pray for people. Oh, good and for you. If that's okay. We could say a quick prayer and um the world and could be used more of that. Yes, 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 yes. But, and uh, we're really looking forward to seeing the, the documentary yes. about Ruben Salazar, which it's going to be in August, correct? Well, there is there there have been documentaries already. Okay. The last one, I think, was Man in the Middle. Um, yes. But this one I'm doing is a feature film. Okay. okay. So it's going to be a film about Ruben Salazar. Correct. And where uh, is there going to be a? There's going to be a website that people can go to that we can share uh, during that time. Well, right now my my position is as writer. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I was I was approached uh, and uh, commissioned to create the treatment okay. for the film. Okay. Uh, so. There are other personalities that will be calling the shots. Okay. Well, um, we're excited. We're excited to see part it. Of it but <laughs> yes. Well, that's awesome to meet the 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 person behind it. Yes. And a wonderful, talented person as yes. you as well. I love love you as an actor. I've yes. always have well, you know, and, uh, and I'm glad that you guys are safe and and and, and healthy and yes. in a good area. You guys too. It's great to see you guys. You know, yeah, you too. You too. To you too. We gotta we're count on us as friends over here. We're gonna Florida. we're planning to take some time and go to LA and and visit all of you guys and that we know over there. You know, and and spend some time, some quality time. You know? Yes. I'll make so, my wife make you some chili. Oh my oh. gosh! I better I better uh, so I can sweat I mean, out. <laughs> I don't want any hair on my chest. Yeah, man. yeah. I, I could do a bod, but it's fine. I can grow a beard. That's cool. If I got to do it that way. That's fine. <laughs> I really appreciate the work that you guys do. It's very, very necessary. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anytime. Anything we can do to help promote what you have, you always. We're here. Uh, uh, Brenda has all of our information. Uh, anything you're doing, we'd like to keep up on and keep in contact and, as well. Yeah, you guys, you guys should hook up with my wife with Latin Heat. You guys are familiar, right? You know, Belle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Latin Heat. That's a we love that. Yeah. That well, Belle's my wife. Wow, oh, wow. that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I heard about that. We. Yeah. Wow, I've actually um. I think that's a magazine, right? I think, you, I think they've it's talked. It's online. Yeah. And yeah, they, I would love to connect with her. Let's do it. Let's do it. Collaborate something with her. We she also. She that. also she also does the trend talk, which are which are yeah. online. Yes. Oh wow. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We'll mention that to Brenda so that we can hook something up. We all have to. We all should work together. Definitely. I love We're Brenda. open to that. We're open to that. I love Brenda, and to show you how much I love Brenda, my second favorite food, I guess, would be tamales. Oh. <laughs> so, so my wife makes tamales, right? And Brenda yeah. came over and she helped make some tamales. Ay, yo, oh, unfortunately, she was supposed to take some home, but she forgot and I ate them. Wow. Uh, you heard that, Brenda, right? You so, so my wife made some especially <laughs> for Brenda. Wow. Just to show wow. you how much I love Brenda, I didn't eat those tamales. Oh. Wow, that is love. 
That's uh, and you, you That's know, definitely not. yeah, you know, Enrique, I want to share some with you. You have a beautiful heart, man. You have a I appreciate heart. that. Yes, and, and and you know, God's gonna open a lot of good doors for you with all these things you're writing, and they're things that are from the heart, and that He's giving you too. And well, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta do our part, support yeah. each other. Yes, and uh, you know, uh. Lay the groundwork for the next generation. Yes. Yeah. That's so important. So they'll know the truth, the truth of yeah, everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so they don't have to feel like they need to ask for, for permission. Yeah. Yeah. And they, uh, with the technology you have today, they can start their own thing. And, you know, yeah. and, and as, as the older Latinos who have the finances should back them to do yeah. all these things that need to be done. You know, I agree. Uh, with I'm, I'm very, very optimistic yes. about their future. That's great Thank time you. to be alive, to see, to see it happening. That's yes, right. That's, that's right. Amen. That's the truth. Well, let's, let's pray real quick. And, uh, and after we get off, we can talk a little bit. Okay. Father, okay. Father, Father God, we just come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Christ and we just lift up Enrique. We lift up his his beautiful wife and, and beautiful family. Lord, we pray always protection over their health, over their lives, over their children, over all their family, everything they have. Father, we pray for provision always and favor in all they do. Lord, let everything they touch be turned to gold. Wherever they have to go, Lord, keep them safe. Let your angels always surround them. Always be covered, uh, uh, that they be covered by you, by your hand. And Father, the tremendous work that they're doing, Lord, let it spread like wildfire. And that the eyes of our Latino community, our people, Lord, be open. Yes. And that we rise in truth, Lord, as always, because you're about truth, you're about love. And I thank you for my brother, Enrique, because he has that truth and love in his heart, Lord, for the right thing. And bless him always. Bless him in health. Lord, touch his body. Make him strong in all things. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. Appreciate it. Did you get any questions? 